Break the Line, narrated by Derek Johnson. At the close of the 18th century, one of the greatest naval men that the world has ever seen was changing naval warfare from an indecisive brush of fleets to deciding factors that controlled the fate of nations. This man was Lord Horatio Nelson. Before Nelson had joined the Royal Navy or was even born, there was but one way to fight at sea, and that was to form your fleet into a line ahead in what is known as a battle line. Now, the only ships that were used in this formation are known as ships of the line, and this term is used to describe all sailing warships that carry 60 or more cannon. Normally, two fleets would close with each other and exchange broadsides until one side disengaged. Usually only one or two fleet ships would be lost by a side in any given battle. Nelson's star first began to rise at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent in 1797. Acting without orders, he left his place in line and charged straight into the middle of the Spanish battle line, causing mass chaos. The fleet admiral, seeing this, then ordered other ships to support him. Because of Nelson's initiative, instead of being a draw, the battle was an English victory. As Nelson's rank increased over the years, so did his ability to make a change in the way his ships fought. By the time of the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, he was commander of the Mediterranean fleet, and when the Franco-Spanish fleet sailed out of Cadiz on the 20th of October, Nelson was ready. As the Allied fleet left Cadiz, the French Admiral Villeneuve formed the fleet into three squadrons. There is the van, under Spanish Admiral De La Vea, the rear, under French Admiral Dumonier, and a mobile reserve, under Spanish Admiral Gravina. All in all, the combined fleet numbered 33 ships of the line strong. However, twice before the battle, Villeneuve gave orders that caused the line to be reversed, and thus, when the battle was joined, the fleet was in a state of confusion. Another thing that the Allies had going against them was lack of training, for due to the British blockade, the fleet had been unable to put the sea and train on how to operate the ships and guns. Nelson's fleet, on the other hand, was in far better shape. His crews were well trained, his ships were well built, and he had a plan. With the Franco-Spanish fleet drawn up in a battle line, Nelson split his 27 ships into two attack columns, with Nelson at the head of the northerly column and his second-in-command, Collingwood, in charge of the southerly column. What Nelson planned to do was split the Franco-Spanish fleet into three parts, with the middle and rear parts engaged, giving the British local numerical superiority and causing a melee action in which the better-trained British seamen would triumph. On the morning of the 21st of October, the British fleet closed with the Allied fleet. However, the wind which was coming from the northwest was fickle that day, and so the British fleet advanced on the foe with all sail set at the breakneck speed of two knots. At noon, the first shot was fired at Collingwood's ship, the Royal Sovereign, and at about 12.30, he smashed through the line, raking two ships with double or even triple shotted guns, causing massive casualties. For the next 15 minutes or so, the Royal Sovereign fought five or six ships at once and was unsupported as she had drawn so far ahead of the rest of the column. As she fought, laid alongside the Spanish Santa Ana, a large 112-gun vessel and flagship of De La Vea, the others circled around and raked her even as she tried to fend them off with her unoccupied broadside. At about 1 p.m., the victory smashed into the enemy line just behind the French flagship Via Santar, devastating her with raking fire just as the Royal Sovereign had done to the Santa Ana. However, as soon as she passed through, she was immediately attacked and entangled by the French Redoutable. This was one of the worst things that could have happened to the victory, for this was the best ship in terms of the crew and the combined fleet. The captain of the Redoutable had trained his men for boarding actions while in port, and so the French Marines, who were up in the rigging, had turned Victory's decks into a slaughterhouse in the first few minutes. Meanwhile, Victory's Marines and 68-pounder carronades had tripped Reddy Tubbs' decks as well. All through this, Lord Nelson had calmly strode the deck with Victory's captain. Then, 15 minutes after Victory's first broadside, a bullet fired by a French Marine found Nelson, and he crumpled to the deck. While Nelson was not yet dead, he was mortally wounded, 
and died at the end of the battle in Victory's Hole. However, at this point, Nelson's death was far too late to help the Allied fleet, as the British captains had been told what to do in order to win, and so the destruction of the combined fleet continued. By the time the battle ended at 4.30, 17 Allied ships had been taken and one sunk. In contrast, the British lost no ships in the battle. A few days later, some of the survivors were caught, and the total number of Allied losses rose to 22 taken and one sunk. The number of men lost is staggering in how large the difference is. The British lost 250 men dead and 1,200 men wounded. In the Franco-Spanish fleet, the numbers are sketchier, with the total number of casualties ranging from 5,000 to 7,000. At the lowest number, the Allied losses are still over 50% more than that of the British losses. In the end, Nelson gained far more than just fame and glory. He earned a place in the pantheon of our greatest leaders and heroes. Through his great vision, he led England to a state of naval dominance that it held until the early 20th century and the advent of the HMS Dreadnought. He also changed tactics from a strict protocol to a state of intuition that acted and reacted to the circumstances at hand. He is, without doubt, one of the greatest admirals of all time. If you wish to learn more on this subject, you could check your local library, or come on down to the Mariners Museum. They have an extensive things library on all things that flow, an exhibit on Nelson called the Nelson Touch, and much, much more. For more information on the Mariners Museum, visit us on the web at www.marinersmuseum.org.